Okay, class, welcome back to probably our last real lesson from our conics unit. Um, we've talked about para, uh, I'm sorry, parabolic um, extensions and application problems, um, and we've talked about ellipse uh, extension and application problems. So I wanted to at least show you and introduce some hyperbola problems. These can be a little bit trickier and a little bit more challenging, but I think have, you know, kind of seeing us go through it might give you some good ideas um, of how to apply this. So I first want to start with a quick definition definition of a hyperbola. Remember that a hyperbola is, we know what a hyperbola looks like. It's essentially these uh, two curved branches. But by definition, the hyperbola is a set of all points where the difference of the distances from two fixed points, the foci, is a positive constant. Here's what this really means. If I have, if I identify any point on one of the branches, the distance from this point to this focus, we're going to call that D1. The distance from that same point to the other focus, that's D2. Now what happens is that when I subtract or find the difference between those two distances and take the absolute value, I will always get a positive constant. It'll always be the same value. So let's say, for example, that D1 is 5, and let's say that D2 is 8. Well, if I did D1 minus D2 and took the absolute value, uh, that would be the absolute value of 5 minus 8. That would be 3. Now keep in mind, if it's easier, I could do D2 minus D1, D2 is 8, D1 is 5, and I still get that constant difference of 3. But what's key is that this happens with any point anywhere on the hyperbola. So let's say, for example, that my point that I was identifying was maybe right here at the vertex point. Okay, so this then would be my D1, and this distance here, that would be my D2. So let's say that D1, I'm sorry, let's say that my D1, this distance was, let's say, 2. And then let's say that this distance here was 5. If I subtract D2 minus D1, or 5 minus 2, you'll notice that I'm going to get that same constant value of 3. So that's kind of one of, that's really the definition of what a hyperbola really is. And there's a couple of different ways that we can apply this. But first, I wanted to kind of mathematically prove to you something about that, that value. So let's think about a few things that we know about the graph. I want to really talk about those distances, but I want to kind of bring in these values that we've learned before of A, B, and C, specifically probably our A and our C values, okay? So... Let's put the um, let's put the point x y um, at one of the vertices. So let's say that you are standing at this vertex. You are right here. I'm going to mark you as x. X marks the spot. And up here we have one focus point, and of course down here we have the other focus point. Well, the distance from this individual to this focus point, we're going to call that D1, and the distance from this person to the other focus point, we're going to call that D2. But think about the values of A and C. We also knew that, just by, the, by what these values represent, we know that the distance from the center to that vertex, we know that that's A, and of course that would also be A down here, we know that the di distance from this center to that focus, we know that that's C. And of course, that would be the same thing right down here. That would be C. So how could we describe D1 in terms of those values? Well, if you really look at it, D1, this distance right here, would be like taking this full distance C and subtracting A. So we could call D1 C minus A. What about D2? Well, if you look at D2, D2, this distance here, is you would have to start by going this distance, so there's A, plus you would have to go this full distance, that's C. So we could say that D2 is the same as C plus A. So we're going to rewrite that as C plus A. 
Now, remember what we saw a few minutes ago. We saw a few minutes ago that if I subtract D2 minus D1, I should get some positive constant value. Remember, positive because we were going to take the absolute value if it became negative. So what is D2? Well, D2 we said is C plus A, and D1 is C minus A. So what happens if we subtract those? Well, when we distribute that subtraction, we'll get minus C plus A. The C's will become zero and we'll be left with 2A. So we could say that the D1 minus D2, I'm sorry, D2 minus D1 is the same as 2A. And remember, we've already talked a lot about that A value as well as that B value and that C value. So keep this in mind as we start looking at a couple of, again, a little bit more challenging problems dealing with these hyperbolas. But I also think that they're kind of cool to just see where some of the application actually comes in. Okay, so the first thing we're going to talk about is kind of sound waves and how they travel. Imagine that two cannons are fired at points S and M. And if you notice where they're positioned on here, these are essentially the focus points, right? They're inside the hyperbolas here. The sound waves that, that travel from these cannon shots, remember sound waves are going to travel out in kind of this circular fashion like this. Okay, but as these sound waves travel out from both sides, they will intersect, and when they intersect, that's where these hyperbolas are going to be forming. So the intersections create these hyperbolas. Now, how does this apply? We're going to look at a little example about lightning strikes and how fast you hear the thunder after the lightning strike. Um, Sorry. <laughs> so suppose that two people are standing one mile apart um, and they see a flash of lightning. Now, we're going to call this person B and this person A, and you'll notice that I have them standing one mile apart. Also remember that one mile is equivalent to 5,280 feet. Okay. So what's going to happen is after a period of time, we don't know how much time, but after an unknown period of time, the person standing at point A hears the thunder. Then, one second later, the person standing at B hears the thunder. If person B is due west of person A, so you'll notice that we drew person B here west of person A, and we know that the lightning strike occurred directly north, so here's the lightning up here, we know that this lightning strike occurred directly north of person A, we need to know where exactly did the lightning strike. Okay, now I've given you a lot of information on the diagram, but I want to explain some of it and talk about how we're going to find some of the missing information. So what I chose to do was to center the graph so that the center of the hyperbola would be at zero, zero, making the numbers just a little bit easier to work with. Okay, since we know that the distance uh, between person A and person B is one mile or 5,280 feet, if we split that distance in half, we know that we would have to go 2,640 feet each direction. So that's where I'm getting these values right here, this 2,640 and negative 2,640 um, for those values. Now, at this point, let's think about what those values are. Those are the values where the focus points are, where persons A and B are standing. If this is the focus point, then that means that the distance from the center to here, in other words, this 2,640, that must be our C value, 2,640 feet. Unfortunately, we don't know our A value and we don't know our B value. Now, the question is asking, where did the lightning actually strike? Okay, so we've got an idea in the picture of where the lightning strikes. It's right here. And we do know one thing about that point. We know that the x value is this 26,400. What we don't know is how high in the air was that lightning. We don't know this y value. In order to solve for this, we are essentially going to need to write an equation. And then once we have an equation for this hyperbola, we can plug that x value in. So a lot of this is gonna come down to how we're gonna come up with an equation. 
Okay, but we can't come up with much of an equation without a few more variables. We, we only have C. We need, in order to write the equation of a hyperbola, we need our A value and our B value. One thing we know right away, since this hyperbola is opening in terms of our equation, since this hyperbola is opening left and right, we know that the equation will start with x squared minus y squared equals 1. Since it's opening left and right, we know that the a value or the a squared has to come under the x squared and the b squared has to come under the y squared. But we currently don't know either one of those, making it awfully hard to write the equation without those values. So we've got a little work to do on here. Now, remember that we talked about that d2 minus d1 and one thing that we said um, uh, we proved a little bit ago is that that distance d2 minus d1 is the same as 2a well if we knew this value then that would allow us to solve for a and if we had a then we could solve for c or i'm sorry for b so we've got to come up with this a value first Remember that the, the rule behind the hyperbolas is that if you are at a point anywhere on the hyperbola, the distance to one focus point, we're going to call that D1, and then there's the distance to the other focus point, that's my D2. Okay, so keep that in mind. Now, we know that the lightning, that the person, the guy down here at, at point A, he hears the lightning after a certain amount of time. We don't know how much time that is, but he hears the lightning after a certain amount of time. Remember that sound travels out from the source, though, in kind of a circular motion. So it's kind of like the sound, that thunder sound. I kept saying lightning, I'm sorry. That thunder is going to spread out from, from where that lightning strike was. So eventually, that sound is going to hit person A right down here, and he's going to hear that sound. We don't know what this value is. We don't know how long it took. But I do want you to remember that that's the same value as right here. These two, um, be, by properties of circles, these two are going to have to be equivalent to each other, right? And keep in mind that this is D1, which technically makes this little piece also D1, okay? So then what's going to happen after that, okay? The sound travels to this, to this point, so then let's talk about what happens outside of that circle. Well, person B is going to hear the sound one second later. So once the sound hits here, it's going to take one more second for the sound to reach person B. So this whole distance here is going to be one second, right? Okay, but if you also think about the, 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 the picture here, this distance here is also, and I'm going to try to highlight this, I have an awful lot going on in my diagram, so bear with me, but this distance that I'm talking about is D2 minus D1, right? It was, again, it was this whole distance, and then we subtract this distance, and what we're left is this right here. So this is D2 minus D1. Keep in mind that we knew that D2 minus D1, remember right down here, is the same as 2A. Now we know that it takes one second to travel this distance. And we also know over here that sound travels at 1,100 feet per second, which means that in this one second, it traveled 1,100 feet, okay? Put it together then, class. If this distance right here is 2A, and we also know that this distance is 1,100 feet, then we could set up an equation here that says 1,100 feet equals 2A. And if we divide by two, that means that our A value is 550, okay? Again, this is a pretty complicated problem. I'm just trying to show you how scientists, and in this particular example, possibly weathermen, actually might study this data. So at this point, we know an A value, 550 feet. 
if we have an a and a c value, we can actually find the b value because there was an equation that we learned, a squared plus b squared equals c squared. So now, remember our goal is here to come up with a b squared. So if we plug in our a value of 550 squared, oops, plus b squared equals 2640 squared, and then we solve this equation for b squared. So if I do 2640 squared and subtract 550 squared, I get a b squared value. Let me uh, slide this over so I have a little bit more room because this is a big number. I get a b squared value of 6667100. Now I could take the square root of this and solve for b, but I don't need it. Remember, my goal was to write an equation, and in my equation, I need b squared. Keep in mind, I also can plug in a squared. Here was my a squared, and I can actually plug that into my equation too. So now I can write an equation. My equation is going to say x squared over 550 squared minus y squared over 6667100 equals 1. Now, why did I want an equation? I wanted an equation because way back at the beginning, I needed to figure out this value. What I knew was this value. I knew this 26, uh, I'm sorry, this 2,640 feet, but I needed to know the y value so that I could know the location of the lightning strike. So now if I plug in that 2,640 in for my x, 2640 squared over 550 squared minus y squared over 6667100 equals 1. Now I have a very complicated equation to solve. My suggestion would be take it in steps. First thing I'm going to do is bring this to the other side. So negative y squared over this equals 1 minus 2640 squared over 550 squared. Then I'm going to grab my calculator. I'm going to do my 2640 squared divided by 550 squared. Um, and I'm going to get 23.04. Then I'm going to do 1 minus that answer. So at this point, I now have this equals negative 22.04. Now if I divide by negative 1, now I'll have a positive. And my final step is to multiply both sides, so multiply the whole equation, by this b squared so that my y squared is alone. So I'm going to multiply both sides of the equation by... 6667100. And that gives me 1469428844. Wow, big number, but I'm not quite done. Now I need to take the square root of that large number. So when I take the square root of that, I get 12122. There's my y value. Okay, now. One, two, one, two, two. This is going to tell me how high in the air the lightning strikes. Keep in mind that since the 2640 was in feet, then that means that this 1,000, uh, this 12,122 is also in feet. If you would rather see it in miles, we could do a quick conversion. If I had 12,122 feet, and I know that there are 5,280 feet in one mile. By setting up this conversion, feet will cancel, leaving me with miles. And now I can divide 12,122 divided by 5,280. And it is approximately 2.3 miles in the air. So it's a, it's a little bit more of a complicated problem, especially with that D1, D2 um, and looking for those distances, uh, but it's doable. It's just some different things to try. 
I wanted to show you one other problem, a second one. This one's a little bit easier. Um, these are nuclear power plants. You may have seen these on some of your travels cross country. Um, they're in the, the shape of what we call a hyperboloid, <laughs> which is a solid that's obtained by kind of spinning a hyperbola about its conjugate axis. So I want to talk about these cooling towers. Let's say that the, di the base uh, has a diameter of 200 feet. So we're talking about the, the uh, I'm sorry, circle down here at the bottom actually has a diameter straight across of 200 feet. Now keep in mind that also means that the radius is 100 feet. Then it tells us that at the narrowest point, well, where's that narrowest point? That looks like that's right here, right? You know, somewhere about part way up it. At its narrowest point, 150 feet above the ground, the radius is 50 feet. So at this point up here, this radius is 50 feet. And then it tells us that at the top of the tower, the radius, so the radius at the top of the tower is 75 feet. So the radius up here at the top is 75 feet. Now I do want to point out that the radius is different at all three places, that it is biggest at the bottom, smallest in the middle, and then at the top it's a little bit kind of in the middle. We want to know how tall the tower is. Now I'm going to make a suggestion. We're going to put this on a coordinate grid like we've done with a lot of things in the past. But rather than positioning it here, like up right on top of the axis, I'm actually going to recommend that we position it so that this, this part right here is along the, uh, the x-axis. So I'm going to kind of position it so that this is going to be right here, which means that when I draw my parabola, I am going to, I'm sorry, my hyperbolas, I'm going to be drawing one branch here and I'm going to be drawing one branch here and this is the, this is kind of the base at the bottom and this is the base at the top, okay, and some things that we know about them. We know that here the radius is 100, we knew that here the radius is 50, and we knew that here the radius is 75. How does this equate into points? Okay, well, if we think ordered pairs, since we positioned it right here at the origin, okay, this point right here must have an x value of 100. And this point over here would have an x value of negative 100. Okay, this point here, this one has an x value of 50. And since it's right on the x-axis, we know that right away, this would be negative 50. This point up here has an x value of 75, and over here it would have to be a negative 75. Okay, how about y values? Well, we kind of knew the y values here when it was on the x-axis, but there's one other y value we know as well. Since it did tell us that that narrowest part, which is the part that we positioned right here, was 180 feet above the ground, what we're saying is that this must be 180 feet. Now, that means that this down here is negative 180 and straight down here, negative 180. So again, we have a lot of points. What we don't know, however, is how far up is this, okay? That's what we have to find out. It never said that that narrowest point was exactly in the middle of the tower. Okay, so we can't make that assumption that it's exactly the same. Okay, in order to find this missing value here, just like with some of our past problems, we need to write an equation. Okay, so what do we know about the equation? Since the branches are opening left and right, again, we know that it's going to have to start with an x squared minus y squared equals 1. We know that the a squared will be cut before the x squared, and we know that the b squared will be here. Do we have any of these values? Well, the a squared, I'm sorry, the a value, remember, that's going to be the distance from the center to the vertex. Well, where's the vertex? Looks like the vertex is right there, which means that that A value is 50, and we can plug in 50 squared right here, okay? In terms of B, um, what do we know here in terms of the B value? Well, we know that 
if we, um, ooh, we don't have a B value, do we? They didn't give us anything about the B and we don't have the C value either, which means that we have to have another way of finding the B value. So here's our equation so far. We have X squared over 2,500, oops, minus Y squared over B squared equals one. But we don't know what B squared is. We have to have another way of finding B squared. We can't use this method because we don't know B or C. So the only other option that we have is to use the equation that we've started to write. Instead of solving for B using the, uh, the A squared plus B squared plus C squared, what we're gonna do is plug in an ordered pair for X and Y and then solve for the B squared with the equation. Now we have several ordered pairs to choose from. The one I'm not gonna have you choose though is this one. Don't choose either of these because as soon as you plug in that zero for y, this whole um, equation or that whole fraction is going to disappear. That's not going to help us solve for anything. So we don't want to do that. What I would say is let's plug in this one right here, the 100 and the negative 180. So if I plug in 100 for x over 2,500 minus negative 180 for y over b squared, now I have enough information to solve for b squared. Well, when I do 100 squared divided by 2,500, I get 4. When I do 180 squared, I'm going to get 32,400 over b squared equals 1. And you can solve this a couple of different ways. I'm actually going to bring the 1 over here and bring this fraction over here. So 4 minus 1 equals 32,400 over b squared. That's 3 equals 32,400 over b squared. I like to solve by writing a proportion and cross multiplying. So 3b squared equals 32,400. And when I divide by 3, I get b squared to be 10,800. Now keep in mind, my goal was to get b squared. Once I have b squared, I can stop. I don't need to actually solve for b. So now let's write my actual equation. x squared over 2,500 minus y squared over 10,800 equals 1. Why did I want this equation? Because way back up here, we said we needed to solve for this value right here. We had an x value, but we didn't know the y value. So now I'm going to plug that x value of 75 into the equation. 75 squared over 2,500 minus y squared over 10,800 equals 1. And I'm going to solve this equation. Uh, 75 squared divided by 2,500, that comes out to be 2.25 equals 1. And again, I'm going to bring the 1 over here and bring the fraction over here. So 2.25 minus 1 equals y squared over 10,800. That's 1.125 1 equals y squared over 10,800. And if I multiply both sides by 10,800, that will give me y squared. So 1 1.25 times 10,800. Uh, and I get 13500. Now this time I do need to take the square root because I do need to know that y value. So when I take the square root of that, I get 116.2. However, that is not the final answer. The question asks how tall is the tower? What we just found out is that this distance is 116.2. That's not the height of the tower, though. That's just the height from the nearest point to the top. So we need to add to that this height. And this height we already knew was 180 feet. So that total height is going to be that 116.2 plus 180, which means we have a total height of 296.2 feet. Um, 
So like our last examples, a lot of it involves drawing a diagram, using your A and B values, writing an equation. Once you have an equation, you can plug values in to solve for missing values. Sometimes though, you just have to look at some different ways to find the missing values that you have. So we're going to have you try a couple of these problems and um, see how you do. Thank you.